Well, there's a lot to talk about and unpack today, starting with inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, the recent report just came out today, hot off the press by Stats Canada, and a lot of people were surprised by the numbers, the CPI numbers that came out. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Bank of Canada and how that report could impact the Bank of Canada's decision on September 6th, which we believe could highly influence the whole fall market uh, for Toronto real estate. We're also going to get into immigration and uh, a lot of media talk. Uh, article recently just came out in the Wall Street Journal about Canadian immigration and its impact on the economy here and uh, real estate prices. Uh, and we're also going to take all of this and talk about how this is all going to affect the short-term and long-term prospects of the Toronto real estate market. This is going to be an exciting one. I'm Ralph Fox. I am the co-founder and broker of record of Fox Baron Associates. We are one of Toronto's most innovative and active real estate brokerages that focuses on central and downtown Toronto. Uh, appreciate it so much for you guys joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. And uh, if you like this content, please, please, please be sure to subscribe below or smash that like button. Okay, let's get into it. So inflation. Today is August 15th and Stats Canada just came out and released its CPI inflation report for the month of July. So why is this so important? So um, inflation is really what is impacting the Bank of Canada's decision to increase rates. Toronto real estate, like all real estate markets, is highly uh, influenced by uh, interest rates. So what happens on September 6th is when the Bank of Canada makes its meeting or has its meeting and they announce whether they're going to pause or increase interest rates. And a lot of their decision making will fall on this report. So uh, it's really important to understand that inflation, according to CPI, as of today for the month of July is now at 3.3%. So that is up and it is up from 2.8% in June. So uh, a lot of um, economists, there's a lot of consensus that was really, really surprised by the number that came up thinking it was a lot higher than where they anticipated it to be for the month of July. And a lot of people and economists were expecting it closer to that 2.8 to 3%. So inflation is coming in a little hot. And this is now pushing expectations that the Bank of Canada may pursue another interest rate uh, hike or hikes uh, this coming fall. So not the best news there. Um, but if you look at um, the actual data that's coming out in the CPI report, uh, a lot of the inflation is being led by energy prices having a big impact on inflation numbers, um, how much that is driven by domestic demand versus uh, other events that are going on in the world remains to be seen, but I don't think it's domestic demand that's really pushing the energy prices up as high as um, other people seem to think it is. Uh, food prices easing somewhat. That's great news. Anytime we go to the supermarket, it's always like $130 for a bag of groceries, no matter what's in it. So uh, it's showing that it's easing from 9.1% down to about 85 So that's great news. Uh, grapes, really, really big news here. According to StatsCan, if you love grapes, this is awesome news for you. It's down by, grapes are down by 40%. So at least some good news uh, in this report. And then, you know, I think the thing that's, you know, most concerning to me, uh, watching these numbers coming out over the last few months, is that mortgages, um, the cost of living is continuing to get more expensive up 30% year over year. It is the major driver of inflation. And so you really don't want to see us get caught in this negative feedback loop where we're raising interest rates to tame inflation, to bring down inflation, when the biggest driver of inflation are interest rates, meaning that we end up raising rates on top of rates uh, without proper justification. And if that happens, that means that we over-tighten and we might find ourselves in a recession by overshooting interest rates beyond where true inflation sits. Now, true inflation is a hotly uh, debated topic as well. Some will argue it's far higher, uh, myself included, than 
actually what they're reporting in the CPI. It seems to be a little too selective. Um, but those are the numbers that uh, the Bank of Canada works with, and those are the numbers that is the standard. So slight uptick overall, but we have to remind ourselves that this is really being driven by the increase in costs of mortgages, first and foremost. So something you keep your eye out for, and this could be a potential problem if we keep raising rates on top of rates for the sake of bringing inflation down. Also to note, which is also really interesting, is inflation is now higher in Canada than in the US. And that's the first time that this has happened since the global pandemic. And one of the other things we've talked about in some of our other uh, con uh, conversations on this channel is that uh, we in Canada are a lot more sensitive to interest rate hikes because our mortgages uh, don't really extend beyond five years. Where in the US, they go out as far as 30 years. And so we are a lot more sensitive to interest rates. So are we driving more inflation here by the fact that we're more insens sensitive to interest rate hikes and yet we keep raising them? So that's one thing really to keep your eye on as this narrative starts to play out going into the fall market. And we'll see what the Bank of Canada uh, actually decides to do. But we can talk a little bit more about the impact uh, as we get into it. Okay, so let's get into immigration. So really, really interesting turn of events. We have a new immigration minister. The Trudeau uh, federal government recently did, or Trudeau recently did a cabinet shift. And uh, we now have a new minister of immigration, Mark Miller. And uh, in a recent interview, he said that his intention is to either keep or even raise its annual target for permanent residents above the half million number. And he went on in that interview to say it's because of the diminishing number of working age people relative to the number of retirees and the risk it poses to public service funding. So this is really important information. I mean, with extended uh, population growth from uh, students to temporary workers, we were over a million uh, population growth last year alone. That's over 2.4%, I think it is, uh, of our overall population. Basically, it's the same population growth in the, that the United States had uh, last year, and they are 10 times uh, our size. So this is really large immigration numbers that we have, and the government is indicating that they are continuing to want to increase these uh, heightened immigration levels. And uh, we are at Foxman very much for immigration. Uh, I think there's a stat that I once read, 80% of all first generation millionaires are immigrants. And uh, I think the whole melting pot idea that built the United States uh, could play a very important role for you know the next few decades uh, here in Toronto and Canada in a larger perspective. So it is something that's welcome. I think the real question is, what is the intent of this immigration? And then what is the impact, especially if we don't have a proper plan in place? So there's a big announcement coming in November where the government will announce what they're doing. Um, but it is predicted that they could either continue or may even increase this heightened level of immigration to Canada. And the reason why they're doing it, there's several, but it increases our GDP, first of all. The challenge with that is while Canada's GDP may be increasing because you have more people renting, more people buying, more people theoretically working and producing, and the numbers look good because it's a national GDP number, um, the real issue is that per capita, our GDP is actually declining. A report came out by National Bank that said that Canada's per capita output, output is set to decline to one by 1 1.7%, and the OEC predicts that growth could be one of the lowest uh, in the developed countries over the next four decades as we continue to bring in people. So yes, the economy overall is growing, but on a per capita basis, our productivity is, is, is becoming less and less at a time where costs of everything are continuing to go up. So that is concerning. And it's also, you know, obviously driven um, to bring more labor into the market to keep costs down for big business. But the real problem is highlighted by economist David Rosenberg, who was recently interviewed. He said that aggressive immigration camouflages the real issue, which is a lack of business investment and productivity here in Canada. And by adding more workers and increasing net tax revenue 
uh, we get that revenue so that we can support our CPP as people are starting to retire and pay out of the system and draw out of, stop paying into the system and starting to draw out of the system, it is really uh, at a cost. And, you know, there was an article by Benjamin Tal where he goes on, economist uh, for CIBC, and he goes on to say only 2% of immigrants work in the construction industry. And so our immigration policy is actually diluting our capacity to build houses. And the majority of our permanent immigrants that are coming here, their IT or white collar or service or uh, you know, higher edu- definitely higher educated, and they're not necessarily the ones who are going to come here to help build the homes that we so desperately need. And so there is a tremendous mismatch between our immigration policy and the policy uh, to build. And uh, there was a recent report that came out and it showed in uh, the 12 months leading up to March, four or five international immigrants arrived in Canada to every newly started household construction. That is the highest ratio of new Canadians uh, to new homes on record dating back since we started calculating this since 1977. So this is really concerning. And the other thing that was like really interesting that I caught uh, as an interesting news blip is that uh, recently uh, Trudeau uh, was in Hamilton and he made this blunder of a statement. I don't know if he's going to roll this back or not. And I'm not here to talk about politics uh, if I'm a conservative or if I'm a liberal or NDP, it's not about that. It's just about looking at what he's saying as leader of Canada from a housing perspective and trying to understand the ramifications of this. And so he said, I'll be blunt, as housing isn't a federal responsibility. It's not something that we have direct carriage of. And this is just an absolute ridiculous statement. Um, the federal government definitely plays a very big role in immigration, and they very much play a really big role on the demand side on the on the equation of uh, housing. Uh, and on the supply side, they control offsea, they control the Canadian Home Mortgage Corporation, they control first-time home buyers plan, uh, monetary policy. Uh, they have a lot of controls actually on both sides of the equation, but especially when it comes to immigration, to just um, put the strain that we have on our housing markets with all this immigration and just put your hands up in the air and say, well, it's not our responsibility. That's just not effective leadership when we need long-term solutions, especially when we're bringing in this many people. And the strains that we're seeing, this is still very much uh, early days. Uh, On August 2nd, National Bank's uh, chief economist uh, came out and said um, that uh, until the government revises its housing policy and construction catches up with demand, uh, the government's decision to open the immigration floodgates has led to a record imbalance between housing supply and demand, and builders just can't keep up with this influx. And all of this is being exacerbated with high interest rates and high construction costs, where it doesn't even make sense at this point for a lot of developers or builders to even consider creating inventory. And we'll talk about that in a second. So we're in this situation where, yeah, as a whole, immigration is a really good thing, But is it covering up some other deficiencies in the economy that we really should be focusing attention on? And if we are going to bring in uh, this amount of people, we really, really, really need to ensure that we have a concisive plan in place. And this is a story I think that you're going to be hearing more and more and more. And probably whenever the next federal election is, will be probably one of the most hotly contested debates uh, on this topic. And it definitely is going to continue to wreak havoc on the supply and demand side of Toronto real estate as we look into the future. So, in the face of Increasing interest rates, increasing inflation, increasing immigration, and increasing uh, uncertainty about the market. What sort of an impact is this having on the supply side of Toronto real estate? So one of the things that we have to understand is is that when we talk about supply in Toronto real estate, it is not uh, a month discussion, a six-month time window discussion, or even a year. You need to start looking out three, five years based on what we're, what we're experiencing today. That's what the market will look like in the future. So a couple really important things to drill down on, and we talked about this in a past video, is Urban Nation came out and they said new condo sales declined by 74% annually in Q1. 
down to 2,300 plus units, representing the slowest start to a year since the financial crisis in 2009, going back to 2009. So that's a huge drop in new sales. And as this trend continues, which we expect it will in pre-construction, that is going to mean that going forward in the future, because most pre-construction sales don't actually get built or completed for three to five years, that's really going to have an impact on down the road three to five years. Another thing is new building uh, residential permits, 10-year lows. Uh, we've shown this chart before, but literally it looks like a ball is just falling right off the table. That again is going to have a three, five-year window uh, impact on supply. Uh, construction industry has lost 44,000 jobs it's lost 4% of its workplace in the last three months. And it's one of the largest drops we've seen in the construction industry uh, going back to the 90s. And this is really relevant because it's a huge part of our economy as well. And this could be not just reflecting an overall slowdown in real estate or real estate construction industry, but maybe even the greater economy at large. And so even if sales were raging, permits were flowing, and construction costs weren't spiraling out of control via inflation and interest rates, labor is going to be a huge bottleneck. And if we don't have an active, agile workforce, even as these things start to ramp up, it's going to take a long time to open up this bottleneck. And so this is really, really important to understand because what that means is, is that we are facing extreme constricted supply three to five years down the road. And whether it's Warren Buffett or any successful investor, they will always tell you to think for the long term. And right now, there's a lot of fear and certainty what the fall market might look like or even what early next year might look like. But the most important thing, if you want to look at things from an investment lens or a long-term uh, lifestyle investment lens, you should always be factoring in what the long-term uh, is going to look like. And when you look at these immigration numbers and the pressure that that is putting uh, on our housing, and then you combine that with what we're seeing, which is, is a tremendous tightening of um, inventory, of sales, of building permits, of the workforce, it really is going to be a problem further on down the line. And just to give you an understanding of these numbers that we're talking about is CMHC projected that we would need in Ontario about 2.4 new homes to have million new homes over a decade to have baseline affordability. The Ford government has pledged 1.5 million new homes over the dec the next decade. They've well, by the way, fallen behind on these numbers over the last couple of years, no surprise. And we ranged, I think, about 680,000 in Ontario the last decade. So far below uh, what the government has pledged and probably even lower than what we've produced in the past decade is where we're sitting right now. And a far cry from that 2.4 million for basic uh, affordability. And so uh, as these numbers will continue to drop, you can really, in, in an extreme situation that we're facing, much stronger against the supply side than we did in the past decade, if this trend continues of increased construction costs, tightening of the labor, or um, letting go of uh, the labor market, um, low sales, low permits, high construction costs, it's going to be really unfavorable to have that supply that we so desperately need, especially in the face mm -hmm. of a 2% population growth year over year that we're facing mm -hmm. and doesn't really seem to be subsiding with no plan in place and no ownership being taken by any level of government to really solve this as a long-term problem. So what does all this mean short-term and long-term for the Toronto real estate market? Well, it's really hard to predict what the Bank of Canada may do in September. Uh, in our team's chat group today, somebody asked the question based on the latest print by Statistics Canada showing inflation has gone up, what our predictions were for September 6th. And I responded completely off the cuff and I just said, you know what, they've gotten everything wrong thus far. So nine times out of 10, you know, they're probably going to make the wrong decision again. And this is something I've talked about ad nauseum in some of our past discussions here. But, you know, uh, they said in, when the pandemic hit that they weren't even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates 
I believe it was to 2024, 2025. Well, that didn't happen. They came out and said that uh, inflation was just transitory. And then they said at the supply chain, while many economists were saying, you know, we've dumped so much money into the economy and all this quantitative easing that of course there's going to be inflation. And that, you know, in hindsight anyways, they definitely should have started raising rates. They could have done it slower and they could have done it easier. And they waited a very long time when there are a tremendous amount of indicators and common sense saying that the inflation that we were seeing in 2021 was uh, symptomatic of something much more ominous. And of course, they missed that call. And then the next call was just to dramatically just start raising at the fastest levels we've ever seen. And, um, you know, the concern is without precedent of something like this, what kind of effect is this going to have on the economy? Because none of it's really taken hold. You know, we've talked about how less than 13% of homes have ever, homeowners have even seen an increase in their monthly payments. And yet our inflation is up 30% in our numbers uh, because of uh, the increased costs of inflation, of uh, borrowing. So this means that it has still very early days of working its way through the system. And everybody knows it takes probably a year, maybe 18 months until you see the effect of a raise. And we've had our 10 or 12 of them, and we really haven't let this play out. So Uh, I think they're mismanaging this one again. I really, really, really hope I'm wrong. And hopefully this doesn't cause uh, a recession. But uh, I guess time will tell. But I think the major point here is, is that, and it's something, you know, when we look back at the past couple of years and how the market has played out, you can really see that markets like certainty. And that's just a basic statement of any market, not just Toronto real estate. And when we went through periods of, uncertainty, the market would pull back. And then when we had certainty, uh, everybody jumped right back into it. And that's really what happened when the market started to go down in the end or sorry, mid to end of 2022, when the rates started going up, we saw that big 100 point basis raise, 100 point basis raise uh, back in June or July last year. And that really shocked the market. And then we saw all of these raises coming up in consequence. Everybody who was a buyer just decided that they were going to sit back. The market slowed in January. They said that we're causing a pause and we're not doing anything. And everyone jumped in and prices shot back up. And now we had this shock announcement in June, followed up by another one in July of each of 25 basis point increases. And it's when we're in these uncertain times that people tend to stand back. Um, We really don't anticipate any type of uh, market collapse or incredible wave of properties coming to market. Uh, Just like, you know, uh, during COVID when we had that mortgage deferral cliff and everyone thought there would be tens of thousands of properties coming to market, that never happened. Uh, And just like back then, as today, banks are working with homeowners. They're extending out amortization periods. They don't want to be for sellers. And so while we may see an uptick of uh, inactivity, especially probably in the condo market, which is a little bit more uh, investor-centric, we don't anticipate a mass flood of inventory coming to the market. Um, But definitely, we expect to see a softness. Uh, We anticipate that the Bank of Canada probably will have a raise or two in its sleeves for the fall. And I think some of the temperament and sentiment coming out of the Bank of Canada and the uncertainty that that will create will cause even more of a pullback. And so it's definitely probably more than likely going to be a soft fall. But whenever that stability comes back to the market and a little bit of certainty Um, we could see activity jump back in just the way it did in 2022 uh, in January, February, and March. So that is something to watch for. But long-term, as we've discussed, basic supply and demand uh, and mismanagement by the government at all levels, I think you're really going to see constrained supply. And long-term, if you have property, continue to hold on to it because it's going to be worth a lot more today than it is in the future. Do not panic sell. And if you're a savvy investor, there may be some great opportunities coming up in the next few months. I guess the best recommendation we can give is don't do anything out of fear. And if you're going to reallocate time and energy and resources vis-a-vis your real estate or real estate decisions to make strategic long-term decisions, 
Uh, we're always happy to talk about those types of conversations here at Fox Marin. If you want to reach out direct, if you have any comments or would like to um, connect with us, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And if you like the contact below, please be sure to smash that subscribe button. We'd absolutely love to hear from you. My name is Ralph Fox, and we are Fox Marin.